this happened when I was in my early 20s. I was working in a retail store in a mall, but there wasn't enough hours, so I asked if there was anything else I could do, and my boss told me that the location at the other mall needed more people, so I could go there on my weekend. I needed to take the bus route that was a bit longer, but I didn't have to make any transfers, so I got up early and caught the earliest one I could. The bus ride was fairly normal. I got to see parts of my city that I hadn't seen before. I did notice that the bus eventually went into a more dingy neighborhood. There was more trash everywhere, abandoned buildings, houses, and cars, etc. I noticed it, but I felt like I was safely on the bus and my destination was in a nice neighborhood. At some point, an elder lady got on the bus and I noticed that no one was getting up to offer her a seat, so I gave her mine and went to go hold the pole next to the side door of the bus and continued on my way. While riding, I remember looking at a guy next to me and asking if he knew about how much longer it would take to get to my stop, but before he answered, someone hit the buzzer to get off. The doors next to me opened and then I felt hands on my free arm grabbing me and pulling me. I, on reflex, immediately clenched up because I generally don't like any physical contact with strangers outside of a greeting or a handshake, and I really think that reflex saved my life because it took my brain a few seconds to register that someone was trying to pull me off the bus. A tall man in a white tank top, blue jeans, and white tennis shoes had come out of the back of the bus, grabbed my arm, and tried to drag me off the bus. He had pulled me down to the second step before I even understood what was going on, and I was just barely still hanging on the pole. The arm he was grabbing had my purse on it, and I actually tried to shake my purse down to him so he'd let go, but he had no interest in the purse. I had just about started calling for help when I felt someone grab my waist and pull me back up towards the bus. The man trying to pull me down must have realized that he couldn't get me without this dragging out longer than he expected, so he finally gave up and ran off. And that was it. The guy ran off, the door shut, and I vaguely remember hearing the man who saved me say something along the lines of, You'd die in that neighborhood. And I had apparently gone into some kind of shock because I only remember saying, Oh. Oh. I don't even remember thanking him. I didn't say anything to the driver. I didn't contact the police like I should have. I don't even remember my shift at that other location. I don't remember the ride home. It was just like I was numb. It was when I was at home and had completely showered and gotten ready for bed in my nightgown that I sat at the edge of my bed and thought, did I almost get kidnapped? I did almost get kidnapped. I had a lot of regrets about this. I regret not contacting the police in case that guy goes after another woman. At least women would be aware that he was out there and I regret not thanking and keeping in contact with that nice person who saved me. I actually posted an article on my local Craigslist in hopes of him somehow hearing it and knowing how grateful I am. So back in 2008, when I was still just the age of 20 years young, I got my first ever real job as a pub bar back in an area of Nottingham called Trent Bridge. My living situation with my parents over in Lenton wasn't great. They were in the middle of a divorce, and the house just had this sort of black cloud hanging over it all the time, so the first chance I got, I moved into a small bedsit on Bunbury Street, which was much closer to the pub I worked at. It was a really crap time in my life to be honest, but moving into that bed set was a massive highlight and a huge boost when I needed it the most. It wasn't much, but it was mine and it was a huge weight off my shoulders to have somewhere I could retreat to, to get some mates over, have a few vodka and Red Bulls and just forget about all the stuff going on with my parents. The wallpaper was peeling and one of the windows was stuck, but I didn't mind the little things much. What I did mind were the group of lads who used to hang around the bus stop on Bathley Street until all hours of the morning. I first noticed them a few days after I moved in. Because of where my bed sit was situated in this large two-story building, which is apparently now a training center for Nottingham's bus drivers, one of my windows looked over Bathley Street where the bus stop was. 
I came home from work at about midnight and had just crept into my room, as quiet as a mouse, when I heard some raucous laughter coming from across the street. I looked out of my window and there they were, a group of young lads in their late teens and early twenties, taking shelter under the bus stop. I thought that they were just waiting for the last bus at first, but after a few hours came and went, and they were still hanging around being loud at the time that I planned on going to bed, I realized that they were just using the place as a kind of hangout spot, presumably to keep out of the rain. That night they weren't so bad, and moved on not long after I had gotten into bed, but on other nights they were just a downright nuisance. They'd be out there screaming and laughing until 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning during the summer and it had to be absolutely dire weather out to ensure that they'd give it a miss. There was a brief break over Christmas, but as soon as it started to warm up again, they'd come back again, every night, without fail. The only times they ever moved on involuntarily was when someone called the police. I actually saw that happen once, but... The ones that had anything naughty on them legged it and while the others just mouthed off to the police while they emptied their pockets and then tossed their little blue stop and search papers on the floor. After a while, I think the police decided to just give up on it and whenever the lads were at the bus stop, people tended to avoid it and just use an alternative. They were a right pain in the butt, but aside from smoking the odd spliff in the bus stop and being obnoxious, I don't think that they were actually doing anything illegal, so I don't think there was much the cops could do about it. Anyway, it goes from winter to spring, and once it started warming up a bit, the lads started hanging around the bus stop again. This wasn't much of a problem before, because my late shift pattern meant that I didn't get to bed until the same time they did, roughly speaking. But once I started taking days too, that all changed. The non-stop racket they made started to really mess with my sleep, and... It took earplugs and ambient music for me to be able to get any decent sleep. God, I wish I had your channel back then. On more than one occasion, I'd open my eyes to see blue lights flashing through the blinds, and I'd take an unhealthy amount of satisfaction when I saw one or two of the noisemakers getting arrested for whatever it is that they had found in their pockets. But for some reason, that didn't deter them. I don't know what they were thinking, honestly. If that was me... I'd have found another spot where I couldn't get harassed by the police. I remember thinking that there must have been some reason they insisted on being there. Like maybe they'd been told to be there by someone who had a vested interest in knowing if the police were driving down Bathley Street. And considering what happened next, I think that might have been the case. Every so often, it wasn't a marked police car that rolled up on the lads at the bus stop. It was an unmarked one. So some normal looking Vauxhall Corso would roll up next to them, some cop would jump out and then they all try and sort of scamper about to do their usual gobbing off. So one night, I was up playing Grand Theft Auto, which had just come out that very week, when I happened to spot the lads at the bus stop while I was on the way back from a toilet break. I lingered for a second, giving them a very disapproving look, because I knew that they were going to be keeping me awake later on that night. But then as I was watching them, an unmarked car slowed down as it came up to them, then stopped about 10 or 20 feet down. I was thinking, yep, here's the police again. But the police normally just jumped out and started chasing people down. Whoever this was, was happy to just idle a few meters down. The guys at the bus stop obviously thought it was the police too. I think only one of them ran away and that must have been whoever had the ganja on them that night. But then instead of running, the rest stayed put and started shouting things at the idling car. I was well up for a bit of street theater, so I stared out the window, grinning to myself, hoping that their swift dispersal was going to result in a nice quiet night for me. Then, the last thing I remember thinking, before the scene before me suddenly changed, was looking at the dark, unmarked car and thinking, hurry up and do something. And then they did. There was a flash, then a bang, and one of the lads at the bus stop just folded. I really do mean that he just folded. Like in the moment after the bang, his head hit his knees before his body hit the floor. It was probably one of the single scariest things I'd ever seen in my life. The night that I learned that no matter how many Tarantino movies you watch, or first-person shooters you play, 
there's nothing that can prepare you for seeing someone get shot with your own two eyes. Looking back, I think the gunshot must have severed the poor kid's spine above the waist and that accounted for the weird way in which he fell. I've since been told that if he'd been shot in the head, I'd have known it as chances are there had been very little left of it. The second I realized what I'd seen, I ducked down below the window and took cover behind the brick wall beneath. I know that must sound melodramatic as no one was shooting at me, but I did worry that there might have been a bit of wild return fire or something from the lads who were running away. I'd never seen or experienced anything remotely like that before, and I didn't know what else to do, but instead of hearing any more gunshots, all I heard was the sound of the dark hatchback burning rubber as it sped off into the night. The sound of the gunshot was as loud as a firework, and seeing as this was the end of April, with no reason to be shooting them off, I'm almost certain other people in the neighborhood heard the loud bang and were just as concerned as I was. 999 must have gotten a hundred calls from up and down Bathley Street and those that surrounded it, but again, I just didn't know what else to do. The only thing I really did know was that the poor lad needed help. He might have been a pain, but Jesus Christ, no one deserves to die in the street like that, all alone, with their friends having just run away from them. I obviously did a lot of talking to the police after that night, both on the phone, then in person, and then in person a third time when we went over my statement and I got asked more questions. The police appealed for more info, but as far as I know, no one was arrested or convicted for it. The general consensus was that it was gang-related, but I don't think the police ever mentioned that because if they did, who would come forward? It'd certainly have me in two minds about going to court if I knew witness intimidation was going to be a factor, but it never came to that. They never asked me, and as far as I know, the poor lad's murder has remained unsolved even all these years later. I moved away from Trent Bridge about a year afterward, basically as soon as I had the money and a nice enough flat came on the rental market. No one hung around the bus stop for the rest of that time either not even to actually catch the bus, and sometimes I'd catch a glimpse of it at night, looking all lonely with no one around it. Each and every time, the image of that lad's body, the way it folded, replayed in my head, and I'm very glad to have moved away from a place with such a horrible memory attached to it. I... A European woman, I'm currently staying in a South American capital. Being a foreigner, I guess I stand out a little, but I didn't feel threatened or in danger at all during the month that I spent there. Until yesterday. I was waiting for the bus alone at around 3pm on a sunny day, no one else around. Then, some guy appeared in the distance. I can't really say why, but he looked shady, probably because he looked like he was walking straight towards me even if the pavement was pretty wide. I pretended that I didn't see him and waited for him to pass, but he came to me and asked for money, maybe something else, but I didn't understand what he was saying. I answered very firmly that no, I didn't have anything to give him and stepped back a little, keeping my hand up and trying to show that I was not disturbed. He kept coming closer to me, making me feel very uncomfortable, and started pointing his finger at my face saying, I'll kill you, I will kill you, repeatedly, over and over. And that's when I started thinking that I might be in danger. Even if the guy didn't have any visible weapon, I had no idea what he was capable of, especially as he was extremely close to me and was still threatening to kill me. Still trying to calmly walk away from him so as not to show him I was panicking, I looked all around for someone who might help me, but the street was completely deserted. And that's when I saw a bus coming. I waved at it and the doors were already open and I climbed in without looking back. The driver's assistant told me to hurry to get in. and He had seen the scene from a distance and told me not to worry, that we just needed to get away from this crazy guy. And this all happened in the span of 30 seconds, but a lot could have gone wrong in such a short amount of time. I'm glad I remained relatively calm and I'll probably invest in a pepper spray for the future. It was around 2015 and I was living in Seattle. 
I worked in an office that allowed me to bring my dog to work, a hundred-pound German Shepherd. He's a big sweetheart, but looks quite scary to strangers. After work one day, I get on the bus home, which was around a 45-minute ride. I noticed someone staring at me and didn't think much of it. While it's unsettling to be watched, I had my fair share of odd conversations on the bus, and it wasn't out of the ordinary to encounter weird behavior. I honestly don't remember too much about his appearance, but I do remember thinking that he looked fairly normal and didn't seem high or drunk. My bus stop was on a busy street in a bit sketchier part of town, but it isn't frequently trafficked. When we reached the stop, my dog and I set off on the short trek home, only a few blocks away. As I exited the bus, I noticed the man who had been watching me had exited too, and something was off about him. He seemed intent on keeping stride with me, trailing closely behind. I've heard advice somewhere in the past that you shouldn't go straight home if you're being followed. I'm sure that's situation specific and sometimes it's safer to be in your home, but nothing had happened besides having my personal space invaded and didn't feel immediately unsafe, so I opted not to lead this stranger straight to my door. I knew that my partner at the time wasn't at home, so I decided my best plan was to weave through my neighborhood for several blocks to try to lose him. I think a part of me was also wanting to be sure that I wasn't being followed at all, or if this person just happened to be walking in the same direction. After several blocks, it became clear that he was following me. I was weaving around erratically, and he was walking the same path. Neither of us spoke to one another and I was becoming more and more frustrated that anyone would follow a woman home. The streets were quiet and I couldn't see anybody around who I could signal to for help. I don't think I would have been so surprised this was happening if I was alone and without my dog. I can't imagine anyone in their right mind following someone with a huge German Shepherd. I started walking faster when I rounded a corner and quickly ducked into a walkway hugging a duplex a block from my house. I was hoping the pathway would wrap around the house completely so I could get out of line of sight of this person, but was met with a fence to my face and didn't have time to backtrack. I was ultimately cornered in this nook between a house, a fence, and a hedge. I crouched down with my dog and waited for the guy to pass us. I watched as the man strolled by the walkway, seemingly not noticing us at all. He didn't turn his head or even gaze in our direction. I decided that we'd stay there for a few minutes just to make sure that he was gone. Of course, my dog was as calm as ever, just chilling on his side taking a nap. Super helpful. About three minutes went by, and just as I was thinking it was safe to head home, the man stepped into my line of sight again. He didn't make eye contact with me, just as he hadn't the first time he walked by. He was moving calmly and deliberately, and slowly came to a stop as soon as he was right in front of me, just off the curb. He was about two yards away, facing me, and not directly looking with just a sidewalk and a grassy strip between us. I watched him as he started to unload his pockets. He had a number of metal objects he was taking out and placing them in a line. To this day, I'm not sure what they were, but I'm glad I didn't find out. At this point, I called 911 and told them what was happening, that someone was following me and showing erratic behavior. The cops made it there quickly and as soon as they pulled up, the dispatcher advised me to get out of there. I hightailed it out of my hiding spot and took a non-direct path home since my house was technically in line of sight of where I was crouched. I don't know what ended up happening with him, but fortunately never saw him again. I'm not sure if he was on drugs, mentally unstable, or both. I don't know if he had malicious intent, but I do hope that he got the help he needed. I'm a transgender male and at the time I was 18 and passed fairly well. I was dating someone online on and off for like a year and a half and finally saved up enough to get a Greyhound bus pass to get from where I'm from to where she lives and it was about 16 hours with a few bus switches. One of the bus stops was in Ohio, Cincinnati to be exact. This is my first time being out of state ever and taking a bus ever besides school buses and I was alone. I'm a short guy, about 5'2". It was probably around 4 to 5 a.m. I believe we were arriving in Ohio. 
I sat down in a little cafe area until my next bus, but then this dirty, scrawny dude with a random license plate sits across from me. He made a little small talk, and then literally asked me if he could pay me to do disgusting, intimate things with him. I'm freaking out already, and it's at this point that I kind of freeze and look at the people next to me in hopes that they'll help. I obviously tell the guy no, and then he asks if he can sell me then. At this point, I get up and basically run as far into the crowd as I can and call my dad. The guy disappears, and I don't see him again. The messed up part is I finally get to the girl, and she tells me her dad had a heart attack. It ended up being a lie, I guess, and I had to go. But I had spent my money, besides for food and water and a taxi to get from the last bus stop to her city, which wasn't cheap, and then had to give her friend gas money to take me back to that bus stop. I didn't have enough for a room, and my dad couldn't afford to wire me any to get a room for the night, so I had to sit at the bus stop literally until 8pm for the next bus, because it was a smaller town, and part of it I had to sit outside because the bus station was closed. It was honestly one of the scariest and most terrible experiences of my life. I'm 25 and born and raised in Arizona, and this literally just happened to me so I decided to bring it here to all of you wonderful people this evening. I'm a huge stoner and don't drive. I decided to take a bus a few miles down to the dispensary. This was at about 8.30pm. I wanted to get a new indica cart, purple punch, it's my favorite by far. I got it, walked back towards the bus stop to get back home. As I walked closer to the bus bench, I noticed a guy was sitting there. I didn't think much of it. I'm antisocial, so I always go into any social setting ready to be absolutely silent. However, I didn't get any chance this time because as I'm sitting down, he starts asking me something. But I had my headphones on and couldn't quite hear what he said, so I took my headphones off and asked, What was that? And he responds, Did you want to get your hair cut? Whilst staring at me, with very wide eyes, not blinking. If I were a betting man, I'd say that he was on something. I'm not here to judge anybody, I just understand addiction very well. I definitely wasn't expecting that question, and I just awkwardly said, Oh, uh... I'm alright. I then noticed that he was wearing an Arizona Cardinals uniform and I just so happened to be an Arizona Cardinals fan. So since my entire socializing abilities revolve around sports, I decided to ask, Hey, you a Cardinals fan? He then looks at me funny for a split second. No, I just got this a few months ago. He says. I then ask, Ah, uh, so how long you been cutting hair? Without blinking, he answered, just picked it up a few months ago. Who taught you how to cut hair? I asked, even more sketched out at this point. His eyes shifted, and then he says, I learned on my own. Come on, man, uh, let me touch up the back a little bit. Mind you, he was consistently pushing to cut my hair throughout this entire conversation. I even told him, yo, I don't have any cash on me right now. Indicating that, like, I couldn't even pay for the service even if I wanted to. But he just answered with, That's no problem. I got my clippers in my bag. Come on. So I just decided to be real with the guy. Listen, I'm real sorry. I, I just don't feel comfortable getting haircuts from people I don't know. And, and like at night and stuff, you feel me? This dude never changed facial expressions this entire interaction. And he finally goes, True that and continues to glare into my soul. I decided in that moment that it was time to just get out of there. Luckily, this bus stop was right in front of our local Circle K, a gas station for those who don't know, so I just walked in there for a few minutes just to kill time, because unfortunately, that bus wasn't showing up for another 17 minutes. I didn't want to stay long, because I didn't want the employees to think that I was stealing or something. Granted, I had a pretty good reason to go inside at the time, so... I waited only about six to seven minutes, and literally as I'm walking out, there I see the haircut guy walking in, still staring directly into my soul. Luckily, I walked past him and just noped out of there to another bus stop down the street. The bus finally got there. I saw the dude at the back of the bus, but 
He didn't bother me anymore, and I made sure to keep my eyes the complete opposite of his direction the entire time. I tend to overthink most social situations I'm in, even if they're extremely quick. But how would you have handled that situation? Would you have let that guy cut your hair? On the morning of February 26th, 1991, a 10 year old Belgian girl named Natalie Gayasbrex was waiting for the school bus at a stop in her home province of Vlaams, Brabant. She lived with her parents and younger brother, Anita, Eric, and little Bjorn, in the sleepy lower middle class neighborhood of Liefdal. And every morning, she'd be dropped off at the bus stop before her mother drove her younger brother to kindergarten. The morning of February 26 was no different, and after clambering out of the back seat of her car, Natalie waved goodbye to her mother and young Bjorn, and then watched them drive away. As she did so, Anita shot one last look at her little girl via her rearview mirror. She was proud of her daughter, immeasurably so, who was displaying the kind of level-headedness and independence that foretold of a successful and prominent young woman. Yet little did Anita know, that look would mark the final time she'd ever see little Natalie alive. Witnesses later stated that instead of remaining in place until the arrival of her bus, Natalie began walking in the direction of a nearby forest known as the Boxy. As she reached the tree line, an unidentified man was said to have appeared. Natalie seemed unperturbed and followed the man through the trees. Another witness this one being a close family friend, drove past the Boxy Woods on their way to work, and as they did so, spotted a gray Toyota that was apparently suffering engine problems. The driver seemed to know what he was doing, so the family friend offered no assistance, but there in the back seat, smiling and waving, was young Natalie. Seeing as the girls seemed to be in a positive frame of mind, the family friend didn't find the encounter suspicious. Only later did they realize just how significant it had been. A few hours later, around 10 a.m., Natalie's parents each received a telephone call at their respective places of work. Their daughter had failed to show up for school. Eric Geersbrecht then called his home phone, expecting his daughter to explain that she felt ill and had returned home rather than catch the bus. But upon receiving no answer, he drove home to search for her himself. Over the few hours that followed, the Geasbrex family descended into a full-on panic as they enlisted the aid of friends, relatives, and neighbors to scour the town of Liefdal for any sign of her. They also contacted the local police force, filed a missing persons report, and ensured that they too joined the search for the missing Natalie. On the second day of the search, police organized a huge search and rescue effort that combed the Boxy woodland as well as the surrounding area. Volunteers canvassed the town with missing posters, while several national media outlets conducted interviews with Natalie's parents in order to raise awareness of their plight. But sadly, only a handful of people came forward with any pertinent information, meaning the mystery behind Natalie's disappearance became more and more perplexing as time went by. Almost a year to the day since their daughter vanished, Natalie's parents had finally started to entertain the unthinkable that their daughter was gone and was never coming back. The police had massively scaled down their search and had admitted that the chances of her safe return were slim to none. However, an organization known as Child Focus had recently taken interest in Natalie's case and worked to both keep the story in the public's consciousness and to find new leads and information regarding her possible whereabouts. In coordination with French police, Child Focus announced a possible suspect in convicted kidnapper Christian van Geluven. The Dutch-born child killer had committed acts of evil in his native Holland, but also in France and Belgium, and despite a total lack of physical or circumstantial evidence, French police told Natalie's parents that they were, and I quote, 99% certain that they'd apprehended their daughter's killer. Some thought it was only a matter of time before such physical evidence was uncovered, but as another year elapsed and Van Galuven was neither arrested nor charged, child focus began to consider alternative suspects. 
One such suspect was named Mark Dutroux and was responsible for the kidnap, violation, and murder of half a dozen young Belgian girls. However, the true didn't begin his cycle of killing until 1995, more than four years after she went missing. Some have argued that this is inconsequential and that the true may have taken a four-year break in between murders, as is sometimes the case with many fledgling serial killers. Yet others have argued that there are other suspects, many of whom were actively killing children at the time of Natalie's disappearance, who make for far more suitable suspects. One of these suspects is Michael Stocks, a Belgium truck driver imprisoned in Holland for the murder of three young children in 1991. In 1992, one of Stocks' former cellmates approached the authorities with a shocking claim. One night, during a deep heart-to-heart -heart conversation, Stocks had apparently admitted to kidnapping a child from a bus stop one morning back in the early 90s. He made a point of detailing just how easy it was to convince the girl that he was a friend of her parents and that they'd asked him to give her a ride to school. Unbelievably, his car then broke down in full view of dozens of passing commuters, but no one had stopped to help out or ask questions and the kidnap had been successful. On first hearing it, the story seemed so implausible to Stock's cellmate that he hadn't bothered to report it. Jailhouse snitching is risky business, and the cellmate certainly wasn't about to risk his neck over Stock's overtly boastful and no doubt exaggerated claims. But as the months went by, and Stock's old cellmate learned more and more about the disappearance of Natalie, he came to realize that every word of Stock's claims were true. After informing the authorities of what he knew, the police acted on the cellmate's claims and arrested Stocks on suspicion of Natalie's abduction. Stocks vehemently protested the accusation, claiming that he had proof that he wasn't even in Belgium on the day that Natalie went missing. Just hours following his arrest, police recovered this evidence and it came in the form of the tachograph from the truck Stocks used for work. A tachograph is a device which keeps a record of a truck driver's journey and after analyzing its contents, the police determined that Stocks was in the French city of Metz on the date of Natalie's abduction. On paper, this was enough evidence to absolve Stocks of any guilt, and he was eventually released without charge. Yet in practice, it suggested the monstrous premeditation of a man who'd long planned to prey on children. After all, it wouldn't be the first time a truck driver messed with or swapped around a tachograph in order to obscure some inconvenient truth from prying eyes. And in Stock's case, doing so would make him a very intelligent and very dangerous predator. It took almost another year, but during the spring of 1993, investigators found their smoking gun. Lo and behold, an intensive analysis of Stock's tachograph showed evidence of tampering, it also discovered that Stocks had forged several pieces of paperwork pertaining to his proposed routes, meaning that he'd been told to go one route but had instead chosen to go another. As soon as this new evidence came to light, Stocks was rearrested on suspicion of abduction and murder, and after the investigation shifted its focus to a series of unexplained stops he appeared to have made, he finally cracked. However, Stocks didn't offer a confession due to how frighteningly specific the detective's assertions were. He confessed because of how frighteningly vague they were. To say that the Dutch detectives were shocked when Stocks finally admitted to the murder would be something of an understatement. Some sources claim that during his second period of detention, the total number of interviews Stocks was subjected to hovers around the hundred mark, but there's no doubt that time and time again, he staunchly denied all the accusations aimed at him. Then suddenly, and seemingly out of nowhere, he gave up. He admitted to murdering a young girl back in 1991, but she hadn't been Belgian, and her name wasn't Natalie. She'd been Dutch, and her name had been Jessica. Over the next few hours, police listened to how Stocks had lured a girl away from a swimming pool in the northern Dutch village of Svag, and unlike Natalie, whose body hadn't been found, 11-year-old Jessica Laven had been discovered just a few days later near a neighboring village. Stocks also confessed to the violation and murder of two German boys, 13-year-old Marco Weiser and 10-year-old Salim Thatil, both from the city of Wiesbaden. 
Dutch police suggested that Natalie had also been one of Stock's victims, but he denied it. His killing spree that started in July of 1991, not February, and despite having already been caught lying about his whereabouts, he insisted he wasn't in Leifthal on the day of Natalie's abduction. Many detectives were quite confident that this was a lie and that in all likelihood, Michael Stocks was responsible for Natalie's disappearance. Yet regardless, they had to play the hand they'd been dealt and instead of expending additional time and resources pushing for a fourth murder conviction, they bet on the three that they already had and sent Stocks to prison for 20 years. Eight years into his sentence in September of 2001, Stocks was taking part in a prison-run occupational therapy program. For some reason, the work he was doing involved the use of turpentine and fluorescent lights, and somehow, Stocks suffered an accident that resulted in him setting himself on fire. He received third-degree burns over 60% of his body, and despite being transferred to a specialist burns unit in nearby Bievervacht, he passed away on September 25, 2001. Jessica Lavin's parents were said to have openly celebrated the news and hung some kind of flag in one of the windows of their home. Many said Stock's death was the result of an assassination attempt. Others said it was he took his own life. But all agreed that it was justice and that Stocks had gotten a little taste of what awaited him below. In a 2011 interview with Natalie's brother, he admitted that the tragedy had forever changed the once close-knit family. He explained that it wasn't so much that Natalie was gone, it was that they didn't know where. Closure, he said, would be a blessing. The unanswered questions felt like a curse. Natalie's brother went on to add that her father sometimes visits the bus stop she went missing from, in the forlorn hope that sheer will alone might force a revelation. But to date, Natalie's fate remains a mystery, and the monster who took her might still be free to walk among us. On the morning of February 10th, 2009, 14 year old David Fortin asked his mother for a ride to school. David and his family lived in the small city of Alma near Lake St. John in Quebec, Canada. The region is known for its frigid winters, and the morning of February 10th was no different. Yet despite the freezing outdoor temperatures, David's mother had a busy morning ahead of her, so she politely declined her son's request, then carried on with her routine. David didn't seem overly dejected. He simply put on his red winter jacket, exited his home, and then plodded his way to the bus stop down the street. No more than 15 minutes later, David's school bus arrived at the bus stop near his home, and at least half a dozen children piled onto the large yellow vehicle. But David wasn't one of them. Around six hours later, David's mother was in the process of reporting him missing to the local police force when a detective asked if she'd noticed him exhibiting any recent unusual behavior. She had. That morning at around 4 a.m., David had climbed into her bed, just like he had when he was a small child, and had gently demanded that they cuddle. Then, at breakfast, David had barely touched his food, something which was highly unusual given his famously large appetite. His mother also informed police that David had been subject to a relentless bullying campaign in recent months, and that he'd mentioned something about being targeted for violence on the evening before his disappearance. Slowly but surely, David's mother started to realize that her son's mysterious disappearance wasn't as mysterious as she first thought. Following a public appeal for information regarding David's whereabouts, Local law enforcement received several reported sightings. One person stated they'd spotted him walking through a town called Medebeshuan, while another claimed that they saw him in Lac Bouchette, headed towards the more rural areas north of Trois Rivards. Both witnesses described a teenage boy in a red jacket, among other features that convinced David's mother that the sightings were genuine. Yet she hadn't the slightest idea what David might be doing in that area, other than making a juvenile attempt to run away from home. Five days later, a truck driver contacted police after learning of David's disappearance, and claimed that he'd given him a ride on the day he supposedly vanished. He picked David up on a quiet country road near Bertieville, 
a small town about four hours drive away from his hometown of Alma. This meant that David had already hitchhiked with another driver, as there's no way that he'd be able to make it almost a hundred miles on foot in just a few short hours. The truck driver then claimed that he dropped the boy off at a small Catholic shrine at the roadside. Such shrines are fairly common in rural Quebec, whose roots can be traced back to their deeply Catholic French forefathers, and many a Canadian truck driver will stop off to light a candle, then pray for a safe journey ahead. The truck driver who gave young David a ride was no different, and he assured the boy that since the shrine made for a great spot to hitch a ride, he'd be back on the road again in no time. He wasn't wrong. Just seconds after the driver had lit his candle and placed it next to the shrine, he spotted a blue four-doored subcompact pull up next to David before its driver invited him inside. This same truck driver was later subject to an extensive polygraph test to ensure that his statement was accurate. He proved truthful at every stage, and the truck driver, who was once considered one of the case's major people of interest, was eliminated as a possible suspect. In an attempt to locate David before he came to any harm, police conducted extensive searches all over the region, as well as initiating a poster campaign designed to raise awareness of David's disappearance. The publicity campaign generated thousands of possible tips, but like in many similar cases, very few of these tips were even remotely useful, and those deemed feasible turned out to be dead ends. Police then organized a team of specialist dredging divers to comb the bottom of the Petite Discharge River, which snakes through the town of Alma. The effort was bolstered by the services of hundreds of local, national, and international volunteers who descended on the town to search the surrounding area and distribute missing flyers. A Canadian youth organization then offered a $10,000 reward, but when the offer failed to generate a single usable lead, prospects began to darken. The most commonly agreed upon theory was that after running away from home due to fear of bullying, David had hitched a ride with the wrong person. But just how bad was the situation at school? Even as young as six years old, David had problems settling down at school. He was diagnosed with ADHD, and the drug Ritalin seemed to help in the short term. But by the time David started elementary school, he developed a severe speech impediment. He was teased mercilessly, to the point where his teachers would end his school days early so he could make his way home without having to run the gauntlet of other children. Children have always been cruel, but it seemed that in David's case, a particular toxic social culture left him at the bottom of an exceptionally brutal pecking order. A year prior to his disappearance, when he was 13, David had been cycling home from school when a gang of children chased him into a dead end, then stole his bike. But the torment didn't end there. The group then dragged poor David to a nearby creek, one that was filthy with pond scum and mosquito spawn, and pushed him in. A distraught David, reeking with creek water, then made his way to the home of a much older cousin, Maxime, who offered him a shower, gave him a change of clothes, and called the police. Maxime was probably as concerned as he was furious, but like many of us, he might have assumed that David had simply been unfortunate in his run-in with the schoolyard bullies. But as he'd come to learn, that simply wasn't the case. Before David had even finished showering off, a group of around 20 middle school-aged youths had gathered outside Maxime's house. They called out for David to come outside and face them, and only disperse when they saw a police car driving down the street. Only then did they see Maxime realize just how dire the situation really was. By the end of 8th grade, David's education was severely suffering, and he was placed in a class for children with minor learning difficulties. This meant that the bullying only intensified, and even some of the kids that had been civil with him during the previous years began to join in on the torment, something which David no doubt found particularly hurtful. By December of 2008, David had taken to going on long walks after dinner, something which Maxime found particularly concerning. He too had been bullied during his youth, and he too had taken long walks in order to clear his head, but only ever when he was feeling truly, truly terrible. Maxime warned David's mother, who begged his school's vice principal to do something about the bullying. The vice principal promised to take action, 
But when classes recommenced following the holiday season, it appeared his promises had been forgotten. On January 28th of 2009, David's mother called Maxime in a blind panic. It was almost dinner time and David hadn't returned from school. Maxime jumped into his truck and drove out into the darkness to find his cousin. David was later found in one of Alma's main thoroughfares, Le Avenue du Pont, and was so cold that after climbing into the passenger seat of Maxime's truck, he was unable to speak in complete sentences until he'd adequately warmed up. I'm really at the end of my rope, David reportedly said. I can't take it anymore. For the next two days, David was kept home from school and sought an exemption until the bullying problem could be resolved. Yet local authorities responded by reminding her that David was legally obligated to attend school until he was at least 16, and that she'd face legal repercussions if she failed to ensure that was the case. And so, on February 2nd of 2009, just shy of a week before he disappeared, David Fortin was forced to return to school. In Canada, there is a well-known French-language TV show called The True Negotiator. Its host is Claude Poirier, a former hostage negotiator turned crime reporter, and much like English-language shows such as PBS's Frontline, it delves into high-profile world events as well as public interest criminal justice cases. And during September of 2011, an episode of the show featured David's disappearance, and presented some previously unshared details with its audience. Poirier claimed that following his own personal appeal for information, he received a call from a member of the public. This person claimed that they had first-hand knowledge that David was being, and I quote, helped by an anonymous stranger. They also claimed that David was, quote, ready to come home, but only under the condition that those helping him are not charged. If they were charged in connection with his disappearance, the caller claimed that they had the ability to make David take his own life. Before ending the call, the anonymous tipster claimed that David's disappearance was partially due to his family's strict adherence to some kind of strict religious sect, which in some passages were implied to be the Jehovah's Witnesses. But when asked if this was the case, David's mother denied being part of any religious organization. She added that whatever was being done to help David was nothing his own family couldn't oversee and begged the anonymous caller to feed them more information. Sadly, the caller failed to get in touch again, and some began to doubt the veracity of their claims. But who could blame a terrified mother for doing all she possibly could to bring her poor boy home? She has since made several pleas to the general public, none of which had been answered in a way that advances the investigation, and to this day, David's ultimate fate remains a perplexing and deeply unsettling mystery. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, Shakespeare is pissed.